Hello and welcome to the Hewitt Family Podcast. This is Pastor Chris Hewitt, and I'm here with my dear friend, Brother Matt Stallman, today. And we got an exciting episode, The Ministry of Keeping Your Children While Ministering. Before we get started, please make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Help us to get the word out. We want to minister to people. We want to, that is our motive. We want to pour into people. And we've got some great interviews coming and uh, this episode is going to be no different. It's going to be wonderful. And then also, if you're watching on YouTube, please go ahead and like and subscribe and uh, share it with friends. And let's get the content out. The algorithms do not like conservative Christian content. So we want to beat those algorithms and get the word out there. Uh, good afternoon, Brother Matt. Hey, how you doing, Brother Chris? I'm doing well, and I appreciate you being with us today. And uh, we're going to get right into it. And again, the topic of this discussion is the ministry of of keeping your children while ministering and uh, we are seeing an epidemic in our churches if you're paying attention uh, that a lot of folks um, are unfortunately losing their children and I I don't believe it's just happenstance I don't believe it's just by accident I think there's some things that are going on and and I will say this and I want you to give your backstory I obviously you're a mentor to me you're a friend to me and I'm very thankful for you. And I, I, I'm, I, I know you're not claiming to be an authority on this issue. Right. Yeah. I'm not claiming to be an authority. That's why I'm, I'm asking other men these questions. But um, I see your children, and I see your marriage. And the reason I want you to be on here is because I, not that you're perfect, but there's a direction that you and your wife have taken. There's a direction your children have taken. And I want to find out more about that. So, Brother Matt, introduce yourself and, and give us a little bit about your background, please. All right, so uh, saved when I was a child, grew up in a Bible-preaching church, uh, but at the age of 17, my faith, I kind of had a crisis of faith, which I think is expected now. Yes, I, I didn't used to think that. Like when I was raising kids, uh, I didn't know that I had a brace for that. Um, but I think what I went through at 17 is not abnormal. I think it's absolutely the normal. And we've mentioned it like this before. It's like when my, my faith becomes my personal faith, right? Not Not just what my dad taught me, not what my church teaches, but, but who is God? How do I find him? How do I personally know him? Not, and not in the sense of salvation, in the sense of the rest of my life, yes, right? Sir. Who is God to me? So that crisis of faith um, led me into a relationship with the Lord, to walk with the Lord, to try to know the Lord and, and to please the Lord. Uh, and it freed me from a lot of things too. I mean, the biggest thing, first and foremost, probably like you know, music and relationships, um, I was able to turn my back on, on some of those things and, and just begin to walk with the Lord. And uh, through that, I uh, met my wife and fell in love, was married. We started serving in Africa. In and she asked you to marry her, she, right? That's the way I put it. If she's <laughs> listening to this, she's probably screaming out. That's not the way it happened. But uh, I, t- to be honest, she said, will you pray about Mary? Yes. So that's yes. not necessarily an ask, but definitely she had that intention. Yes. So, um, but so the Lord led us to Africa, and Africa was a, a wild journey for us because we saw that we really weren't prepared for that level of ministry at that point. And it, and it was difficult on my family that my wife and two children at the time. Um, so coming home from Africa, transitioning back into ministry in the U.S., another difficult transition, you know, coming back um, from being full-time in the ministry, a full-time missionary, to first job was a, a, a janitor at a janitorial company working nights cleaning toilets all night long i want to say something right there a lot of times and i don't believe you failed for those wa- watching or listening brother matt and his family they planted two churches that were uh that are still pastored by nationals yeah. to this day that was in the late 90s that those churches are still going being pastored today i don't believe you failed but a lot of times when that that missionary first comes back there, there is a sense of failure yeah. and there is this idea that they're finished and you were a young man you weren't finished and they go into oblivion right right and 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 that's that's kind of what i wanted to do yeah it's like okay tried that i'm not cut out for missionary work absolutely failed in the sense the the emotional side of what we experienced because all of the sickness and financial issues that came through that move back um and so so what you want to go off radar you yeah. don't want to give up on God. You love God, but you go off the radar, get get out of people's sights so people can't attack you. And so that we did that for about three years, just went back into work. Um, and it's like Jeremiah, if I could have stopped, I would have. I tried. Yes, sir. I could go to work. I could afford a nice little house. I could just go to church, support missions. But God wasn't going to let that happen. So God pulls us back into ministry. 2007, we started training missionaries. And then shortly after that, I took a church, started pastoring at the same time. And 
Um, did that, juggled those things till 2018. And then we, in 2018, really went dedicated full uh, throttle back into missions to try to evangelize the world. So that's kind of the, been the ups and downs of ministry, some business involved in that, some work as a janitor in there, some uh, work in a construction company. But since 2017, there's been no looking back on as far as following the Lord and, and knowing who the Lord was. Yes, sir. Me. Well, uh, so I, I love the background because there's uh, you've done a little bit of everything. And, and you've done the missions. You've done evangelism. I think that's safe to say. Yep. And obviously the pastor. And, and a lot of men do not get that kind of background. But you've brought your children along this whole time. And uh, so I want you to tell us. Tell us a little bit about your children, what they're doing for the Lord. So our oldest child, uh, oldest son is Nathan. Nathan uh, was born just uh, about a year before we went to Africa. So during the Africa time there, that ministry, Nathan was just a baby. And, mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, for him, uh, he has no memory of that now. But uh, he, he did well adjusting to Africa, well adjusting to life there, uh, besides the sickness, the malaria. So he was about a year and a half old, and then Caleb was a newborn when we went. So Caleb now is 24, but Caleb was a newborn. So Nathan and Caleb were raised those first years in the ministry in Africa, and it took a huge toll on them physically, uh, but they didn't get to feel the weight of that ministry, yes, you know, some of the pressure of that. They didn't, they didn't get any, under any of that. But today, Nathan is a pastor. He's outside of St. Louis. He's pastoring a little church there. Just took that about three months ago. So he's in his first pastorate. Uh, Caleb is at our home church. He's a youth pastor at our home church. He's doing missions from our home church. He's got, uh, just came back from somewhere in the Middle East. He's getting ready to go to South America here next month. Yes, He's sir. with us right now here doing a training in Indianapolis. So Caleb's been involved in the ministry. Um, ben is still single. He's at home. He's 19 years old. And uh, Ben is called to preach, surrendered yes, to preach, and uh, really has a heart for evangelism. Um, and is doing well on his way in that. has a, has a passion for souls. Has a gift. Has a gift. gift. Yeah, I hate I hate to say you know too too much, but he really God is using him in a, in a great way. Yes, in that. And then my my daughter's she's our youngest. She's eighteen, and I, I've seen God's hand on her to use her in, in, in uh, witnessing to people. We was out Salt Lake City area yes, right, in the Mormon region recently, and uh, um, got to witness her just go up to young ladies in parks, sit down under a shade tree with them and just open up the Bible and begin to show these young Mormon girls the way of salvation through yes, Christ. Sir. So um, all of them have experienced <clears throat> uh, difficulty. All of them, I, I guess, again, that, that moment of life, what, what, which I would call a, uh, uh, a crisis yes, of sir. their faith, a crisis in their walk with the Lord. Uh, but God has been faithful to bring them through that, and I'm, I'm thankful they're serving the Lord today. One of the things that I probably learned the most from Brother Matt, in, I, and you can maybe speak more to it, but there was a ser there was a season in your life where um, you you were kind of like in your what some people would call your prime, your your age, your in, there was a lot of influence, your preaching, and you stepped away from that and took a church during that prime. Uh, so you could invest with your children. And, and what I, I've watched that, many of you know, watching, I have a special needs son. We've been on, we were on the road for 13 years full time, and it, it impacted me. And I may kind of walk us through how you came to that. That's not the norm a lot of times in ministry to kind of step away from your prime to do this. But would you, and, and what you think maybe how that influenced your children now? So in 2007, when we, we really felt the burden to go back into missions. Um, at that time, the older kids would have been, you know, eight, nine years old maybe. Um, the younger kids would have been just babies. Mm -hmm. Ben and Amanda would have been really young. So in 07, we did, we invested back heavily in missions. We started taking trips. Uh, we started doing the missions training. Um, I quit my job, left everything. Um, started, I started over again with life. So no salary. Um, I just bought a little place out in the country, started doing the missions training, and that was an incredibly stressful time. Like, uh, we bought a church camp on a handshake, had no money down, had, <laughs> had nothing. Um, I mean, the utility bills used to come in at $1,000 a month, and that payment was $2,000 a month, and um, had no job, and we're just, we're fighting our way through praying, praying that in, um, preaching somewhere every Sunday, just busy in that, and, and it, 
it started off well. God started using it, but but those those five years of having little children in that type of ministry, uh, it was fun. It was exciting. We grew together, but it was pretty incredibly stressful. It was requiring me to be gone quite a bit. I would either be overseas or I'd be on the road. A lot of times, leaving my family alone, and um, and it, I, I I just I had that sense that the investment I made in the older two kids, I was losing in the younger two. Mm. And, and a lot of pastors had warned me about that. I had one pastor specifically warn me. He said, be careful because he said, as ministry grows and as burdens increase, he said, your younger children will miss what your older children had. Wow. And he said, we're in danger of losing our youngest. And uh, he, he said that from personal experience. His younger, uh, youngest child walked away from the Lord. And he said, I see now I overinvested in ministry during those crucial years. So... By 2012, I, I could I sensed that okay I've got preteens now they're 12 and 13 years old and I've got five and six year old that family was good marriage was good but I, I sensed okay if I keep pouring into this level I am going to miss something Are these formative years uh, I'm going to miss so I I just praying about okay God how do I how do I stay focused on my family at this time what do I do local how do I free up more weekend space and there was a little church in our town that had six people hmm. and they were looking for a pastor and, and someone mentioned it to me and I'm like oh, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for them you know I, I I've had, heard you say stuff I like that no <laughs> interest I didn't want a pastor let alone the pastor a little church with six people yes sir um and the building was all running run down and, and it was in a bad part of town and it, it, there just wasn't anything there for me and the church we were in at the time was, was healthy. The, the, you know, kids kids were doing well, had a, had a fiery preacher, uh, and the choir would get up singing the glory of God had come down. You know, I mean, it, it was just we were happy where we wanted to be. But something in me, God just kept drawing me back to that little church. And at the time, I couldn't see the big picture. I just saw this church, is, you know, this is going to be too much for me. Almost like a minimizing. Yeah, would well, you f- it's, you're stepping backwards. Yes, sir. You know, because uh, I had the opportunity to preach to some, usually hundreds of preachers, mm-hmm. uh, uh, people on a, a Sunday or conferences, and and you are stepping back, um, and you're slowing everything down. So the Lord really had to deal with me on that. We would go by and sit outside that church some on Wednesday nights, and I remember a couple Wednesday nights we're sitting outside, and a car pulls up in the parking lot, and we're thinking, man, do we go in or not? We don't even know if we want to go in and see this church. And an older man got up, and he stuck a note on the door, got back in his car and left. And I went up to the door and looked, and the note just said, no services tonight. Mm. They had no pastor. They had no preacher. There's only a few people left. And, and God really began to break my heart over that. It's just funny because it's a change in heart because I have the heart of an evangelist. Yes, I sir. love to go. Uh, I love to preach the gospel to, in regions where it's never been heard before I, I love to teach people things they've never seen and open their eyes and I've never had a pastoral heart but that night specifically going up to that church reading that note and going back to the car and thinking my goodness it, here's a group of people without a, without a pastor so we did it we I, I jumped off the cliff and, and I took that church and it, it was a radical change for us from what we had done in missions and it was a radical change for my family. I remember the first six or eight weeks, my kids cried all the way to church. Oh, my. I mean, I, and it wasn't just my kids. It was Kathy and I, too. I mean, we'd get in the car because I'm thinking, like, I'm looking at the clock. I'm thinking, man, Brother Parker's probably getting ready. He's already in the office. He's greeting people. The choir's practicing right now. You know, the, what we left was what we wanted. And what we got is what nobody would want. But what you needed. It's, well, it is what we needed. And so through the, the seven years to follow, God did work at the church, and I'm grateful for that. But what God really did is he worked in my family. Our, our children began to take responsibility for their walk with the Lord and for their ministry. We didn't pressure them, and this is the, the tricky balance of a pastor raising your kids in a ministry. How do you let them be children and let them still engage you know the world as a child in that innocence and yet allow them to grow in their responsibilities of, of taking on on work at the church so those were those were interesting years kind of balancing all of that um 
there were times where they didn't want to be there and the times yeah. where they didn't want to be around me and times where they were tired of hearing me preach but god was gracious to begin to birth in them a desire for the scriptures and studying the scriptures we did we did some simple things as the boys got a little older we took our midweek service and we said okay our young men are going to do the midweek service we're going to study the book of acts chapter by chapter each of the young men had an objective one is going to look at the cultural uh context of the scripture what's happening in this context one is going to look at the uh, uh geographical context where are they somebody's going to look at the biographies of who is involved in this passage what are the men and we had six teachers every every wow. midweek service and each of them had you know 10 minutes a point and each of them had one point and and stuff like that my my kids at 13 14 years old it's like okay it's it's monday i gotta get serious i gotta study yeah you know, i gotta know what's Acts chapter number three what's happening tonight and our church began to embrace that okay it's not that the 13 and 15 year olds did a better job than an older man could have done but what happened is we begin to see that our, our church came and studied up to check check the boys and see okay these guys study their bibles tonight so we started to create that energy among our young people and especially among my boys um where they begin to take that responsibility including them it, it they took ownership of ministry and as they got older they started doing some of the children when you're in a church of six people your your 12 year olds the children's church pastor you know yeah. so we started running buses bringing in buses and by that time the church is growing but uh, Caleb at 12 years old was sort of the children's church pastor. He's preaching the gospel to, tw- to you know, 10, 12 year olds. And we started seeing young people get saved, us kids get saved and baptized. That? And uh, so that seven year break from missions. Now we still do missions trips, we still do missions training, but the emphasis slowed back down. It, it came to our community and it came on our family. And for those seven years, God was very gracious to let us serve together in those formative years of our, our children's ministry. I, I want you to talk about, uh, if, you're, if you're willing, I know Nathan has shared that crisis time in his life, and you've talked about your children developing a walk with God. And I think a lot of stories like Nathan's do not turn out like Brother Nathan's has. Right. So would you share a little bit about that? So, you know, with Nathan, um, I go back and I examine some of these things, and then you don't want to overthink, but I, I definitely see what was going on in Nathan's life is the first 10 or 12 years of his life when we're in a solid church and things are going well and the youth department is, is growing and they got, they've got a, there's a vibe among the teenagers, and they're content with what they have. Mm-hmm. They love Jesus, they love each other, they love the fellowship. And pulling away from that for him initiated, I think, the crisis of, I don't know that this is fair. So to serve God cost me my friends, it cost me, you know, the things that I enjoy. But what it also did for us as a whole is it opened our eyes to how detrimental ministry can be if it's not Christ-focused. This is not the fault of a Sunday school teacher or a pastor. It's just human nature. We get involved in the community, and the community becomes the central part. And we didn't realize till we left our church how true that was of us. We love the church. Mm. And, of course, we love Jesus also. But the church became the focal point of the weekend. It became the focal point of what we were doing. And, and of course, now it's easy to see, but... At that time, I couldn't, but I could see Nathan and and Caleb both, but specifically Nathan because he was older, almost growing bitter towards ministry or even to me at some points. Because Because ministry took all that away from him. Ministry is what took him from those relationships. All right. So he was learning in a roundabout way that the benefits of Christ applied to the fellowship of Christ, but not specifically to the service of Christ himself. Hmm. There was, and again, as a child, you know, there is very little taking up your cross. That's right. Church is just a blast. Your friends are, that's your life. You're homeschooled. The weekend, you live for the weekend. You get to know everybody. You get to hang out with everybody. So so what I couldn't see in Nathan is that there, there was a smile on his face those few teenage years while I was pastoring there. There was resentment. Um, towards ministry 
And I think every ministry kid that's going to get honest right now is going to say, absolutely. You know, too much time required for my dad. Uh, we always had money for ministry, always had money for missions, never had any money at home. I mean, think, think, about, think about all of these, the cost, the cross-bearing. My dad, when I was 11 years old, took a stand on a, a biblical issue at the church I grew up in. And it was a large church, like you're saying, vibrant, wide open. This was in the late 90s. So I was in fifth grade when you were on the mission field. Um, <laughs> but he took this stand, and that stand my dad took, in my eyes for a little while, took every bit of that from us yeah. because we had to, we had to leave. Yeah. So. And, and, and I think, so I think all ministry kids deal with that. And then they see, they see things, and we didn't have a terrible time at that church, but they see people say things against us, and they see the sacrifices we made that people don't appreciate. Um, you know, look, we, you're the pastor's family. If there's not enough food, you eat last, right? It, How much of that do you shield from your children uh, uh, and your wife even, mm -hmm. what people are saying, how things are going? How much of, you, of that do you kind of put a wall up? Yeah, and I think that's going to be based on, on your timing with your children, where they're at. If my, if my children were already struggling, I would shield them quite a bit. But on the healthy days where our family is in love with each other, where we're in good fellowship with Christ, I will let them bear, see my heart. I'll bear my heart to them and let them see some of those things. Because the truth is, subconsciously even, they see it already. They know, they feel the vibe that's happening. Um, and I, I've always taken a policy to be very, very open with my kids unless specifics need to be shielded. You know, yeah. individuals or maybe at a time in my kid's life, they're struggling. But typically, those conversations are going to come on Sunday night on the way home from church. Yeah. You're going to have to air things back out. Um, and and it, it does take a call. They don't come out without scars. That's right. Ministry kids but will have anything scars. anything in life. Anything in Absolutely. Life. Absolutely. And and it can be good for them. And, and so ultimately what our kids are seeing specifically the older kids in that time of ministry, is there is a lot of joy to serving the Lord, but there is a cost. There is a decision to be made, a, cro a, a cross to be carried. And um, I think what they're looking for, and all kids are looking for, is is it real? Okay, not does it cost. Everything costs. You want to be a doctor, you're going to school for 12 years. You know, you're going to be $200,000, $300,000 in debt. There's a cost, okay? They're not afraid of the cost. They're afraid of paying a price for something that's not real. That's right. And we've got to admit, around us, we have saw enough hypocrisy to know that some people were in it as a game. Yes, they sir. profited from the ministry. They profited either through power or, or finances or something. Something was wrong. And then it's hurt us for, you know, the pastors and preachers around us that have fallen. Mm -hmm. And boy, that's taken a toll on my kids. You know, that, that, do, is anyone real? Does anyone mean this? You know, and, and of course, most of our friends have not fallen. No. Ninety-five percent no. of them. But that toll. So, so the boys are weighing this question. Okay, if if it's real, I'll pay the price. But how do I know it's real? And I think that is the college age question when a kid leaves for work or leaves for university or leaves for Christian college. What am I doing? Is this really real? And, and I think all my kids have, have faced that question, and Nathan faced it in a very real way. But his approach to the question after a little while, after he, he, he let emotion out of it, all right? He took a de deep breath. He let emotion out and said, okay, I know how I feel about some of the things that we've been through. But truth is going to have to be the determining factor. And so Nathan sat down. He was actually on a mission trip down in the Caribbean. And he sat down with a Bible in a room one night, and he basically said, I'm going to read this Bible until God speaks to me, until I, 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 I know what my dad believes, I know what my pastors have taught me, I know what the, the Bible college credits that I have have taught, but, but I got to know God. And he approached the Bible in a way to, to test it, in a sense. Can it be trusted? Who is Christ? What has he done? Is this real? And, uh, you know, he gives that testimony quite often now. Yes, sir. That, that that night, sometime in that night, I think it was the end of the Gospel of Mark. So he finished Matthew, and he was almost to the end of Mark that night. And God very specifically, through his word, 
gave him the answer that he was looking for and brought him to the reality of the Christian life. Not even not to salvation, but to the reality of Christ is worthy. He's worthy. And and that, and it's very similar to my story at 17 years old. Is am I really going to do this? Yeah. Because I'm going to abandon. If if Christ is worthy, then I'm going to abandon everything else. Am I really ready to abandon all of my ambitions for Christ? And I could see Nathan on that teetering on that decision. Not is he a bad kid or a good kid? He's a good kid. But is Christ worthy? And he came home from that trip a very different person. How about that? But during those years, you you have to let your children ask those hard questions. Yes, sir. And, and we and, and a lot of times uh, in our I hate to say the word circles or our types of churches, we don't want people to ask questions. Yeah. No, we we absolutely don't because we're we're afraid that they might come up with the wrong answer. But but the truth is, if you're asking the right question to the right person, and the right person is the Lord. The answers through his word here's the thing they're going to get an answer somewhere and if we're not giving it to them they're going to get the wrong answer somewhere else if we're not willing to give it to them and, and i tell you brother we 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 you open up the discussion like this is so many have disappeared yes sir uh, statistics are 80 percent right we raise our kids and that's in christian school and home school or just that's the christian school that that's christian school home schools or church kids all right 80 percent don't 80 percent disappear at college level um doesn't mean they're not saved. Doesn't mean they'll never come back. It just means that gap, all right, from 18 to 25-year-olds in our church, there's this massive gap where 80% of them have have just shot out. They're gone. And we cannot stop them from asking questions. We cannot ridicule, ridicule their questions. We have to actually embrace their questions and say, let's, let's talk about that. Let's work through that. Yeah. And uh, it is scary. I was 21, and I, I made a list. I wish I still had the list. I don't have the piece of paper, but there was 24 things that I had either been told we do or don't believe. And for six months, I just went to the Bible. I would yeah. just take that whenever I got done with that one, I would just go to the next thing on the list. And I, I'll just be honest, I came out on the other side a little bit mad that a lot had been withholding yeah. from me. And I can understand, you know, I, I, I imagine that some of the, the issues that Nathan had at that time were probably justified issues. Like there were real issues, and if we're not if we're not careful, if we don't keep our eyes on Christ, we will we will depart. Yeah. We we will go because if we look at men, and that's what for all of us. If we look at man, we will be disappointed. I, I, the the and I obviously we we homeschool. I was public school, Christian school, yeah, <laughs> and homeschool, all, all three. So I can I I think we have the ability to talk a little bit about this. But I think one of the dangers of home and Christian school is every day they're being confronted with the things of God, but every day they're not always being confronted with the power of God yeah. and the, the a walk with God. Especially with Christian school, you're not just getting a curriculum. You're going to the place where you go to, if I can say, and if you're, if you're not watching, I'm making quotation marks, meet God. So six days a week you're in a place. Yeah. And, and, Five of those days, that it's dry. So, so this is a question of law and grace, and that's in a Christian home, Christian school. Uh, it's very hard as a parent or as an administrator of a school or as a pastor to teach people that we're under grace and then actually raise our children under the law. And by, by meaning that, by saying that, like I'm talking about being in a Christian school, and hearing how wonderful Jesus is, and then getting my tail whipped because my hair touched my collar. Yeah. You know, like 14 lashes, you know what I mean? And so I kind of grew up under some of that. I'm Give thinking, him the cat. Yeah. How, how Give can, him the cat. How can these things both be true? Like, I remember not turning in homework assignments and getting getting swats. I mean, I'm talking some great swats for just missing a homework assignment. And I thought they were optional, honestly. I didn't know you had to do them. So but I <laughs> found out that the hard way. Uh, and, and so, but we do that in our homes too. Yeah. Okay. We raise our hands on Sundays and talk about the grace of Jesus. And, and then when we come back, we, we come back into our home in a very hard, staunch, r- rigid Christianity. And we've got to be very careful in doing that because everything that we're teaching in our home is based upon the principles and the doctrines of Christ. 
And so is there punishment for wrongdoing? Of course there is. Is there reward for doing right? Sure there is. But the spirit behind it, the spirit of the, I, can I say dark days of fundamentalism, was very rigid and it lacked love. It lacked answers yeah. and it lacked love. So if I'm going to tell And you were children, coming out of that era. Yeah. You, yeah I, see, I, that is very foreign to me. Uh, and me and you've had that discussion before. It was almost the opposite. I, I, I didn't grow up with that rigidity. Uh, probably needed a little more, just yeah, to be honest. Right. But you grew up in the coming out of that bad spirit era of, of all of this. Right, and it wasn't in my home necessarily. My mom and dad were, were kind, yeah. and we had a good home. And, and my church wasn't necessarily that. But it was prevailing in the in movement, the, in, the, in the movement, the atmosphere. There, there was that. And so... Uh, I remember just sitting down with my kids, like doing Bible studies, like, hey, here's why you can't do that. Like one of the verses we had to memorize all the time, and I'm trying to think if I can remember it now, is um, uh, he that ruleth his own spirit is like a city broken down without yes, walls. Sir. All right, the man that cannot rule his own spirit. I heard Caleb quote it the other day. <laughs> that Caleb was yeah. the one we had to, yeah. He quoted it the other day. <laughs> so so we were, we were, dealing, we were doing Bible studies with the kids, like, hey, why, why can't you do that? Okay, you just punched your sister, right? All right, what, what's going on here? You know, why can't we do this, and, and what's going to happen? And, and I remember one time doing a, a study with one of the kids on, uh, on the rod. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're just doing a Bible study on the rod, and Kathy read a verse to, to one of the boys, and he goes, that's where that came from. I'm like, yeah, we didn't make this up. Yeah, like we're trying to protect you and your future. And one thing we realized early is if our kids were isolated inside the walls of our home, then it was very hard to understand evil and good. So by doing missions, by working in the community, by going to the prisons, by going to the jails, by going to the funeral home, by going into the hospitals, by going to the streets and into the mission. They started to discern the outcome of evil. Oh yeah. Like what is what could this lead me to? Where will this go? And I think sometimes we have overprotected children from the perils of life so that they they literally just they don't have the the ability to process how dark evil is. Isolation, not insulation. Isolation, not insulation. I, there, there was a, a instance recently where we were dealing with a young person that had made some really bad decisions. And it very, very obvious. Our children were seeing the ramifications of this, and to God be the glory. God, God touched that that situation. This young person made the right decision, and has abandoned that, repented, got right with people they needed to get right with. And I bless the Lord for that. But even with the the right outcome, we sat our children down and talked about the process that got that person to yep. that point, because and like you're saying ministry is dirty sometimes and, and you've got you've got to show them the end yeah the the, the hog pen needs to be seen not not experience yeah. it, it, it might keep the experience from happening probably 14 12 there's a way that seems right unto yes man, sir the end there over the ways of death so if you pull back the veil a little bit and you let your kids see into the world all right we're not talking about watching filthy television no. we're talking we're but we're talking about taking them on a journey where they can see uh, the, the things that appear, the pleasures of sin, right? The pleasures of sin, it appears as though it's all you would ever want, but it always leaves you with the same tragic outcome. It steals everything from you. And ministry with kids allows them to see the dark side of that. And so when they're making life decisions, they're making life decisions based on all of the evidence. Yes, sir. And whether that is uh, morality, you know, and, and keeping themselves from marriage, or whether it is entertainment on television, or whether it's the music they listen to, um, everything from a cigarette to alcohol, they're, they're seeing an honest perspective. And, and we got to admit, you and I are both, we're both at age now, young people are coming to us, we're counseling them for marriage, we're counseling them, you know, for decisions that they're making. And there's an innocence about them that I admire, but the truth is some of them are almost worthless. Oh yeah. Because they're stepping into life decisions having no idea the consequences of the wrong that they've done or of the things that they're about to do. And so 
within reason. You must take your children and let them see beyond the the consequences beyond the veil beyond yeah. the veil let them see w- what what this really is and and a way to do that a lot of the ways to do that is do inner city mission work yes sir do inner city you don't have to go to africa that's what we're doing find yeah, an inner yeah, city yeah our children have seen prostitutes come into the tent and seen dro- drug addicts that that are ticking and they're wondering why why are they they tweak yeah. yeah, we call it tw- it's called tweaking but they're making these moves they don't that and my children and your children they've seen that the first of sin They've seen season. they've seen the end of sin and right. it is death. Uh, I, you know, obviously we're in a generation now that have maybe overcorrected. Yeah, there were a lot of things in your the generation you grew up in, which I was I was growing at the same time, but I was very young. I didn't see it like you did, but that '90s harshness, if we can say it that way. Uh, I believe there was a lot of things that those men really took the right stand on, but you hit the nail on the head. They were not willing to take the time to explain and there were things that were extra biblical i'm not going to pretend there wasn't but there were a lot of things that were right and i'm afraid my generation because of that has thrown the baby out with the bathwater. and and i think just going to the book and we're 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 seeing that in discipleship we're just talking teaching people how to walk with god and love god and those questions of those other things are coming and we're not having to give people a list. We're teaching them how to live a life. And then they come for us, to us, like, well, what does the Bible say about this? And I think it, it can reflect in, in child training as well. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's a, uh, it is a slippery slope if you yes. start casting all the blame. Like if I, I agree. If, I, if yeah. I look back and I say, okay, um, I'm this way because those men made those mistakes. You know, all men make mistakes. And... Uh, the men who poured into me in my young days uh, were sincere and real, That's right. and they're still in it. They're yes, still sir. in it. They're still, they're and still I wouldn't talk about you, yes. you're, but the but, movement is a whole. But, but I, when I always hear the, the guys who are, are bitter, right? You yes, hear, sir. You hear the bitter guys. I resonate. Yeah, I saw that. But where, where are our eyes? Where are we supposed to be Not looking? Not on Jesus. And where am I putting my— doing that. Yeah, where am I going to focus my children's eyes? I'm going to spend the rest of my life in a place where I'm looking to Christ, thankful for the investment made by my father and by my pastors, thankful for the doctrine they gave me that was Amen. sound, for the faith they gave me that was sound, the mistakes that they made we've learned from. And then when I look back at my life, even now, and my kids and I will get to sitting around laughing about some of the things I taught or did or something. I, You know, I mean, there's days where I was just wrong. Yeah. And then, there's, there was one day the kids would not stop at the back of the car. And, and my kids are old enough now I can tell child abuse stories and not worry about losing <laughs> them, okay? But but one of them was, was just being a brat. And I just turned around the seat just to just to let him know to stop. And I, I popped him in the leg or something like that. And the car got silent. And all of a sudden... The other kid said, uh, Dad, you got the wrong one. <laughs> you got the wrong kid. <laughs> and, of course, you, what do you do? You have to pull over and fix, and apologize. And fix this and apologize. And I have spent my life apologizing for things that I've done wrong. I, I am a man. And if my kids wanted a reason to be bitter, they'll find they'll it. They'll find it. If I wanted a reason to be bitter, I would That's find right. it. And here's what the Scripture says. Take heed, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And thereby many be defiled. The men who are living in bitterness have set their children into a cycle of trouble. Bitterness and trouble. Bitterness and trouble. you got to break the cycle. Yes, sir. My pastor wasn't perfect. My father wasn't perfect. I turned around to the same thing to my kids. And I'm going to watch my kids live a non-perfect life. Yes, sir. They're going to make doctrinal mistakes. They're going to make mistakes when it comes to child rearing. And by the grace of God, our children adapt and overcome. And, the, and God, God is good to us. That's right. So it's about direction, not perfection. Yeah. And I, I was yeah. just, I was admiring though the, the even though you grew up in that, you did not get bitter of those things. You appreciate those men, and you've taught your children to watch, yeah. to look well, at Jesus, and given them answers. And, and it, the truth is, they should have whooped me more. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> all the things I did, I yes, didn't sir. get caught doing. Well, uh, what about your wife? Uh, what role did Sister Kathy play? And in, in obviously, probably uh, more. Our wives do 
more of this than we do. Yeah. So, yeah. So really, th- that's the way it is. Is is if you were to figure hour by hour, percentage wise, seventy five percent of everything my children learned and embraced had to come from their mother. Right. She yes, was sir. she was the one involved in that daily routine. You know. Uh, getting them up and usually praying with them and starting off the school day and feeding them and uh, y- y- once once the kids turned you know 10 12 years old they started shifting that to me so I started taking them to work I put a lot in them but those those first years that it was all her yes sir um, here here is where where she invested is it was her spirit yes sir again man if we're looking for for, for perfection we're never going to find that. But the spirit was one of adoration for Christ. And, and Kathy grew up in an environment uh, that what I would consider more liberal than what I would have. But yet the advantage of that is there was that admiration of Jesus, you know, of, of who Jesus is and how lovely he is. And then later when, when we started uh, courting, dating, whatever you want to call it, when we, we started really getting to know one another, um, we found out that we we had some differences on, on dress or on even like I think she had that time uh, still using NIV off and on different things like that so we had some differences on some things but but her her spirit was unbreakable the this simple love and admiration for Christ and who he was and so if you have that in your home that that undergirds you know, it, it strengthens the foundation for the home is no longer the rule of the home. It's the spirit of the home. Yes, sir. And so you can you can bring up kids in a non-perfect environment, but yet in that gracious home where Christ is being glorified. Uh, one thing Kathy has always loved to do is sing or to play music. Yes, sir. And, and so all of, I still can't. You heard me try to sing today. I, still, I cannot. I don't know why. I cannot sing. He cannot sing. I can't, I, but I do. I do anyway. It's a blessing. All right. So, but the, the kids, you know, by five, six, seven years old, they're playing the piano. They're singing. They're playing the guitar, and uh, and that that comes from her. So that spirit that she brought into the home was conveyed first of all, I think, in her compassion. Uh, Kathy will cry. Like if I if if I sneeze and tear up, she'll cry. Right. So Kathy will cry with anyone who's crying. If she's and just, your children all have yeah. that ability. Yeah. When something gets special or serious or sweet, they all immediately yeah. weep. Yeah. She brought that compassion, that spirit. And, I, and look, I don't I don't have that. I'm not mean or ruthless, but I don't feel that. I don't feel that. Like if you broke your arm right now, I'd be like, dude, everybody breaks their arm. Get over get it. Get over you know, it. I, I don't have that. So she brings that to the home, and then she brings the music, the worship. Yes, sir. Um, and and those those are things that that categorized, I guess, uh, defined our home. When when you when the kids were little, there would have been music and there would have been compassion. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. I've I've for years I've talked about uh, the the Trinity in the home. How the the dad is a picture of God the Father. He makes the decisions, carries out the judgment. It's his. He's kind of got a law in the home, a direction. Okay, the mother's a type of Christ. So the father, bring, he's the head. She's the heart of the home. Yeah. She's that compassion, the mediator. She keeps the father from killing the kids. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, all that joy in the home. And then the the children are a type of the Holy Ghost. They're the help in the home, and they're fulfilling the the desires of the father and the mother, and they're a mirror, they're a representation. Right. And so uh, I think you just nailed that on the head with the compassion, the music, the, the tenderness bring, coming into the yeah. home, and we need more of that. And, and you, have to, you have to facilitate some of that because she, she will break in that. She will break in that. So those are things that have to be uh, restored, yes, rejuvenated, sir. because the wife, the wife is – on the home front, taking the brunt of the work, yes, she's sir. putting in most hours. It may not be the most rigorous work, yeah. but but the the brunt of of the effort going into that home is on the wife. And so, if you don't pull back and refresh her, and and that that's done that's done through your just kindness. It, it's done through gifts. It's done through words. It's done through vacation. It's done through rest. She will come to the point where she loses that soft edge. Yeah. And if she loses that edge and the kids can't look to her for compassion, if she's in that broken condition, 
they're going to miss that element and you cannot let that's unacceptable to let yeah. happen so I've, I've always I've been on the soft side with my wife if my wife needed something I give it to her yes sir. like if I need to get a second job or a second mortgage what my wife needs she has yes sir because I need her constant refresh I need that that spirit up and so if she needs a vacation if she needs time off she needs to go out with her sister uh, what she needs she gets that's right and uh, God's been good to allow me to be able to, to provide that for her we've never been wealthy but I've, I've always made that a priority I'll find the time or the money because I can't lose her and we say this all the time you lose your marriage you lose your ministry right but it's deeper than that you lose um, your marriage you lose your marriage you know yeah, <laughs> you right. lose your I can marriage. lose my ministry I'll start yeah. back over right I mean I'll move over I'll I can't lose my marriage everything in my life my testimony my children all of this stuff is so dependent upon how this works this relationship and there's a lot of trips i did not go on yeah a lot of offerings i didn't contribute to a lot of things i could have done that i did not do because i saw the need to reinforce my marriage at that time and i've never had any regrets and that would be called keeping the uh, your finger on the pulse of your home. Yeah. I, I, I've heard it yeah. likened like that. You and that's why you stepped back. Uh, it, right. uh, that's why you backed off because you, you saw where your children were at, and then talking about a uh, consistent that with the, with our wives, just keeping your finger on the pulse yeah. Of, yeah. of your home. You know, here's here's the thing. My my children are not grown, and uh, I'm I'm young. I feel like I'm young. And Kathy and I have the next thirty years to go turn the world upside down. Amen. And I'm not doing it alone because I got my kids stationed now all over the world. They're doing their own work. By the grace of God, we'll have grandchildren joining us in the work. And uh, there, there is something about that reproductive cycle. It takes time, like gestation takes time. So for those 10 or 12 years sometimes, like, man, I could be doing more. Well, you could be doing more, but the long-term result of this is powerful. You've got to keep that which God has given you in the moment. Yes. You cannot let that go. Yes. You know, and I was just thinking through this, that, that, and we're no, no way saying don't go to the mission field until your children are gone, but, um, and it's, this is not just about missions, yeah. obviously, but, um, you know, there needs to be stability, and you can have stability on the mission field. Abs you, absolutely. You can have stability in the pastorate of, uh, I, I, for a long time, we had stability in, in evangelism. Right. But the, you got to keep your finger on the pulse of your family at that time. And I've even told, I told a man the other day, he was like, uh, I, I feel like God's called me into missions. And he said, when should I start deputation? I said, how old are your children? And he said, well, I got one left in high school for two years. I said, if you pull him out now, you may lose your son. Yeah. I said, do I, and, and look, my whole ministry's called who will go, you know our our ministry's called who will go you're training missionaries that's what we do but for the sake of keeping that family keeping that child let him finish high school and, and then go because if you root him up you're going to put a root of bitterness in his heart and you know what you're what you're really saying is let your kids vote let them speak yes sir. and i i know I, I always used to tell my kids we'd go to mcdonald's back in the poor days you know we had to be poor when we were going to McDonald's. They had a dollar menu. Yes, sir. They don't have that anymore. No, no they don't. It's as expensive as anything else. But back in those days, my kids didn't get to vote. Like, you know, I'm going to deal out a sandwich. You're going to get a McChicken. You're going to get a McDouble. Uh, you're never going to get fries too expensive, and you're going to get a water, right? But my kids would say something, well, do we get to choose? I said, you live in a dictatorship, not a democracy, <laughs> all right? But, you know, I had to change on that. You know, that's a little – Little kids at McDonald's, right? That was kind of fun. But as my children started growing into young adults and young men and young ladies, they did get a vote. They, I did have to hear how they felt about yes, sir. that. Okay, what happened at church today? What do you, how do you guys feel about that? What, what happened there? What do you think? And, and I know you could take this wrong. Don't take it wrong. But my children started being my counselors. I'm starting to hear their, their perspective is important. They're seeing things and hearing things I'm not seeing and hearing. And so you start letting them at this age, okay, I'm going to go to the mission field. You're 16 years old. Okay, no, I have to know what God is doing with that 
young man's life. And, and that's what I was about to say. This particular young man feels no need for missions. He's in the 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 the, the prime of his youth. Yep. He's got all his friends. There are young people that are wanting to go. Yeah. So it's a it's a case by case. And the, but the reason I said that is I really feel like that man would have lost his family yeah. if he did that. And I've seen it before where the the wife or the child nor the children were on board and they're leaving everything behind in the middle of those special days, and and they end up losing everything. Yeah. And and brother, those are hard decisions. Oh yeah. And I'm not, I wasn't saying a blanket. I, I wasn't saying no. a blanket statement. And I haven't. I I cannot think of a decision I've faced in the last decade that my wife and my children were not on board that's right. in some way. I'm not saying that my wife was like, that's exactly what we should do. But my wife came to the point where she said, I think that's what the Lord wants. Yes, sir. And I'm with you. All right. So if there's that pause or that hesitation, if I'm going to pass her and my wife's like, I don't think I can do this. Well, then I need to back up, slow down and say, what is going on? In my life right now, how do I how do I work through this? Mm-hmm. Okay, because I'm not going without her. I'm not going to go without her. So, wh- how do we reconcile this? Is one of us missing the Lord, or is the timing wrong? But we're two shall be one. We are, we're only one person. So something has to be reconciled. Yes, there. And and even again, even you see, your children shouldn't have that privilege. My children had the privilege to speak to me directly. Because we don't want to lose them. I need to know what's going on in my children's world. Yes, sir. And I, I don't remember a time where my kids said, I don't want to. I can't believe we're doing this. And I said, you have to. I don't remember that time. Mm-hmm. I remember times where we had to sit down and, and, and discuss why we were doing something and what was the best course of action and had to come to the conclusion, well, this is what the Lord wants. But to force my children, uh, to force, I, I've never forced my children to go to church. Say, well, what if you had to? I don't know. I never had to cross that bridge. I never had to say, wake up, you're going to church, or I'll spank you. <laughs> I can't. I never had to cross that no. bridge because those bridges were crossed in in the in the younger years. Um, but yet, if if I cross that bridge, I would have to let my children speak into that situation to see why wh- why what is happening here. And that's checking the polls. And we've got to be able. I'll tell you what: children and wives will identify that men will miss danger yeah they will identify danger if there's something strange going on somewhere sometimes you we we just fly right in. through it they will pick up on it and it could be that your wife is not obstinate against god or your children are not trying to get away from god it could be they sense something or something is experienced in their lives that they have a genuine check in their spirit about and and that open communication is just vitally important yes sir yes sir well, uh, I want us to close out with this, and, and just what is your advice, and I know we've talked about a lot of it, but what is your advice for right now for, uh, you know, somebody raising children? I mean, I've got a, a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old. I'm on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. We've got, uh, you know, we're here doing the School of Evangelism in Indianapolis, and we've got multiple families with little children. Right. What What is your advice for these that are in the ministry uh, raising children? Uh, you know, it, it, it will sound like a cliche, but if Christ is central and love is abounding in the home, the details can be worked out. You know, the details of discipline, the details of how rigid to be, how much to go to church, how, how to move them around, the details are, are going to be, a lot of it's cultural on that. So you're gonna have, you're gonna have like with your culture, the way your kids have been brought up, and, and you and Miss Chloe, you'd be in church 10 nights a week and still be happy, (laughs) you know? Everybody's always like, I can't expect my kids to sit in church. I'm like, why not? (laughs) So, so those details are, are, are going to come individually to our families, but the forcing, the force feeding of God into someone's life, I think is detrimental. Yes, sir. So introducing my kids to God in a positive light and letting them see the, how fantastic the Bible is without forcing them. I, right. I've seen people use the Bible as a punishment tool. Mm. You guys didn't do this. You didn't get your room clean. Go write right. verses. Go write verses. And I, I'm sorry if you've ever done that. You're I'm wrong. Sorry, but that's in, that's that's yeah. crazy. Yes, sir. T- take something beautiful 
and make it the punishment. That's right. All right. So that repulses them. From yeah. So, and and then to make the Christian life the rigid black and white do's and don'ts. Mm-hmm. And I know. Uh, all right. So, so let's th- let's take something as simple as a kid gets a ten dollar bill for Christmas, and as soon as they get it, you snatch it out and say that's part of that's God's. All right. Is that true? Well, actually, I believe all of it's God's. But yeah. how do I introduce that yeah. subject to my children without telling them God is the mad, the bad guy? And, and, and what we do and on that is exact thing is we taught that one time, you know, about giving. When that when they got to an understanding, and then now we say, well, what do you want to do with that money? And, and, and here's something like this could be so easy because you can approach it and say, hey, you just got that money. Let me tell you one of the greatest things about God. He is generous. And look what he gives to us. All right, let's act like God does. Let's live generous. And when you teach it that way, who needs something, right? What needs have you seen? Okay, all right, well, we have vacation Bible school coming up. Whatever, you're teaching them that God is generous. Instead of saying God is stingy, I've heard people preach a tithe yes. and a giving system as though God is stingy. I know they're not saying that, but it's what we're Come feeling. Across. It's what yeah. we're feeling. We're feeling God is stingy and angry. No, God's generous. All right, so I'm going to tell my child, look, God is so generous. Look what he just gave you. Let's act like God, and let's, let's show generosity. Okay, and everything that we do then, the nature and character of God is revealed through us to the lost. So all of God's nature is good. All of it. I, I, I got this idea in my head, and my kids brought it at some point, that God is just angry all the time. <laughs> and, 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 and I know, I'm not calling names, but I, there's guys who preach like it. Yeah, God's always angry. But God is actually the perfect picture of goodness yes sir and kindness and gentleness all of the fruit of the spirit all right but what is that that's god in me coming out love joy peace right so we're taking the negatives of god and we're turning them to the positives of god god's not stingy he don't want your money god is generous he gave you money let's act like god to be generous all right so god is good in all things so even the things that we view as negative in our children's life or they view as negative have to be reconstructed into the positive is God has put perimeters to protect us from certain things. I mean, you do you illustrate this with a pet. I mean, why do you keep that bunny and that pig in the pen right there? Because there's 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 coyotes. Yes, sir. What if we let him out and just let him go in the woods? Dad, he'll get eaten. I say, you see how God has put boundaries to protect us, right? So we're teaching the positive. Take the negative spotlight off of God. I'm tired of being to hear how bad God is when God is the greatest thing that we've ever experienced. So we've got to turn the paradigm. Yes, sir. That's good. That's good. Well, I appreciate you uh, being with us today, and uh, I'm thankful for the knowledge and and that's been passed down to us, but also that God's allowed you to garner through through ministry, through life, and and I really do appreciate it. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, If you would, again, share this, like this, get it out there. I think this is very valuable content. Not because I'm here, but because of the folks we're getting to interview. And I I hope you have a good day, and may the Lord bless you.